Good afternoon, everybody. So about three years ago, we got our first contact of an adoptee and birth parent who connected on Facebook. And the agency is about 22 years old. So we've been managing post-adoption relationships as they've been aging. Um, but we were quite surprised by this phenomenon because uh, it was really overtaking us faster than, you know, than we were aware of. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the cases. There's been subsequent cases and how we're managing them. And quite frankly, I often feel like we're just barely one step ahead. And every relationship that we manage, we learn from, and every um, situation that we're dealing with um, gives us more information to inform us and help us advance this um, very dynamic and potentially problematic phenomenon. So Facebook really took me personally by surprise. I couldn't, didn't really understand it and didn't really understand why people even wanted to be on it, but obviously it has a lot of attraction for many people, including our children, um, and they live in a world which is immediate and impulsive, and my daughter would tell me that she had a thousand friends, you know, 900 of whom she'd never met. Um, and so it was a very surprising thing for me as a mother and certainly as a professional. Uh, but obviously it's got a lot of, um, as Adam said, it's, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it is, and it's real, and we have to deal with it. This is something we found recently on a Facebook page. So this is a, an even more dramatic example of how young adoptees and probably birth parents as well are getting their story out on the internet and looking for uh, any information that they can find. And what I found when I was, uh, began doing research on it is that the UK was having a lot of Facebook adoptee birth parent issues. And so a lot of the resources that I referenced toward the end of the presentation do have some interesting articles from the UK. And there's a booklet that was written by a woman in the UK about managing adoption on face, in the Facebook era. Um, I couldn't find a whole lot of literature in the US when I first began looking. Again, this was about three and a half, four years ago when we first um, encountered our first case. Some of the social workers who worked with the adoptees um, 16, 17 years ago would, would get um, messages like this. Um, I'm looking for my nephew. So at some point, she had the so someone had the social worker's name. The birth mother still remembered the social worker's name. And this family member searching. And what I advise all of the social workers who get these kind of Facebook messages is, you know, write back and ask them to contact the agency. Um, and most of the time, we can't give them a lot of information because it's not the actual birth parent who's contacting us usually. It's usually a relative. And so we say, please have your sister call us. Um, you know, please have your daughter contact the agency so that we can talk about um, what she needs in terms of contact and information. And here's another example, too, where this, um, where this uh, family member's looking. So we're trying to advise families before these things happen about how to create some safety and parameters and boundaries around it. But even when it happens, we can still come in and, and do some, um, some safety planning for the adoption itself. Um, I believe there's probably thousands of adoptions that have been opened up through Facebook contact, and they may be going relatively well. Um, every, they may have come to their own uh, conclusions about how this relationship can grow. I know that we see the ones that are problematic. When they're problematic, they call the agency. So by no means do I think our case studies are necessarily representative of what's going on out there. It's just the cases that really have turned to us for help. 
So there's a couple of different case studies I want to talk about and how we've been managing them, and they've been ongoing now for about four years. Um, the first one, a young adoptee, he's almost 17 now. When he was 13, he looked through some pictures of his birth relatives that his adoptive parents had, and unbeknownst to the adoptive mother, his birth mother's name was on the back of one of them. And so he immediately um, Facebooked her and found her and requested her friendship. And she called us the next day and said, this has happened. I think his adoptive parents need to know. We're not sure what to do about it. In the second case, there, an adoptive family of a 16-year-old had been sending regular updates to the birth parents and their 16 year, and she had met, they'd all met in the hospital when he was born, and she was a very young woman, she was 14 when he was born. And they'd met in the hospital, and so they knew each other's names. And so I imagine what happened for her is that she got a Facebook account and realized, oh, I know his name, I can Facebook, I can find him on Facebook. So she reached out and requested his friendship on Facebook. And he went to his adopted parents and told them about it and they were extremely distressed and called the agency. The third case um, actually didn't begin through Facebook. This was a 19-year-old who was adopted through the agency. And when he turned 18 and he was ready to go to college, he wrote his birth, each of his birth parents a letter and uh, got a letter back from them and so sort of started the, the contact that way um, and has had subsequent visits with his birth family, um, and a lot, of it's, a lot of the relationship is being managed on Facebook. So I wanted to include that because that has its own challenges too. Um, and then in our uh, fourth case, which really just happened a few weeks ago, um, the f adoptive mother had promised her daughter, when she turned 18, I'll take you to Washington to meet your birth mother. And so they called the agency and said, um, we'd like you to facilitate this meeting, but if you don't, it doesn't matter because we found her on Facebook and we're just gonna contact her directly and meet. And so we said, well, we're absolutely willing to facilitate it and hopefully you'll bear with our process, which is to reach out to her and talk to her and do an assessment of where she is and whether or not she wants this contact. So. All of these cases have become compromised at different stages. Uh, and the main reason being that the birth parents and the adoptive parents did not stay in alignment with each other. Um, what happened was a triangulation between the adoptee and the birth parent. And the adoptive parents um, then were not, what we promote is parent to parent. The parents the adults need to be together, they need to be in alignment, they need to make agreements, they need to respect agreements in the interest of the child. And it, it, in all four of these cases, that did not happen. And so we're still helping all the parties manage the disappointment and the pain and the confusion um, around these. Um, I think what we're always so awed about at our agency and maybe other agency professionals can relate is that these situations are so complicated. There's so many complex emotions that get activated. So back to the uh, young birth, um, the young adopted uh, boy at 13 who found his birth mother. Um, this originally looked like it was going to be a really promising uh, story. Um, we, because the birth mother called the agency when she, was, when she was contacted and said his adoptive parents really need to know this. And they had been exchanging information over the years um, very regularly. The, the adoptive parents would send updates very regularly to the birth parents um, and vice versa. And so we contacted the birth mother and the birth mother and the adoptive parents and me and another worker had a wonderful meeting one night at the agency where we uh, mapped the family history, all of the extended siblings, the half-siblings, the step-siblings in this child's life, and looked at all of the different players. The birth mother was divorced from 
uh, the, the adoptee's father and had two other children by the same father. And so the young adoptee was a very is a very anxious child and was in therapy and was starting to have some problems in school. He was in middle school. Um, and he was meeting with a therapist regularly who said he thought that the contact with the birth family would be a good thing for him because he had had so many questions about his birth family. And uh, er, since he was a young child, even his adopted mother reported that he had so many questions. So we got them all together and uh, we facilitated a few times. Um, before, after the big meeting, we also had the birth mother meet with her original social worker. Uh, which is one of the nice things about being an agency with a little bit of a history is you have some of the original workers who worked with the birth parents at the time, so we were able to get them together. And she was functioning really well. She had a good a second marriage. She had um, a, a lot of problems with her older son, who was this young adoptee's um, uh, older brother. Um, she was working full time. She was very functional. Um, and generally seemed to be quite healthy. And they embarked on a series of get-togethers. They got together around sporting events. They went, you know, they played mini golf. They went to games. Um, they always did something um, out there that was active. And um, the, it seemed like the relationship was really moving along in a very healthy and positive way. And what happened is, um, that the adoptive mother at one point realized that the birth mother was communicating directly through text messages with the uh, adoptee. And so that kind of began the breach of trust um, for the adoptive parents and the birth parents. Because before that, they'd always communicated directly that we're gonna get together. You know, they did the adult parental logistics um, that families do. and she found these text messages. And so that really concerned her, especially because some of the text messages were me negative about her. So um, as this went on, and she would come to us for advice and processing and how to deal with it, the birth mother stopped responding to the agency um, and said she really didn't need our help anymore and didn't want to uh, take our support or anything. And so the adoptive family was out there with their very agitated son now who continued to have a lot of problems and actually have more and more severe problems to the point where they began sending him away to various residential treatments. Um, this was also an issue for the birth family because they knew that there was something going on with the boy, but the uh, adoptive parents didn't want to talk to them directly about his mental health issues. So the birth mother could, would only be left to her speculation about it. And she became increasingly resentful toward the family because they weren't forthcoming with her. And um, she would try to text him. And of course, in residential treatment, he didn't have the opportunity to do that. So as this went on, and he comes back and forth from these residential treatments, as this went on, at some point, um, he, was going to go, he was going to a treatment facility in uh, New England. It was about his fifth one at this point. And he, while there, he became involved in AA and told his counselor that the last time he had visited his birth family, they had offered him drugs. And so he, and, and in the course of being in AA, he shared this with his adoptive family. And, the, and he was very angry at his birth family for that. Once he got into AA and processed it with the support of AA, he realized this was not a very um, parental thing to do. So <clears throat> this, this adoption is still, you know, it's still bumping along here. And now he's back from residential and he's confronted his birth family with, you know, when I was 15, you offered me drugs. And I really wish you hadn't done that. And his birth mother said, um, I was just trying to be the cool person in your life. 
So now he wants to um, be in relationship with them again, and his adoptive parents are very skeptical of their ability to be safe, and the birth family won't talk to them because they're ashamed of what happened. And I s advised them, I said, you have to think about this as parents. And if you want to let him go see his birth family, because he's driving now, and he wants to spend the night, and you're willing to give that permission, you need to have a conversation with the adults in that house as to whether or not it's safe. And you would do that with any family. So I think, you know, this is just an example of how in every other realm, this adoptive family is completely empowered to set limits and talk to other parents about, you know, are you showing um, movies that we don't want our child to see? And are you letting your children drink in our house? Because we don't agree with that. Yet they needed some permission from the agency to say, yeah, you have to be a parent and ask those questions. So, so this adoption is still going on. This contact is still going on. And um, it's got its challenges. Please interrupt me at any point with questions. Yes. The boy is almost 17 now. So this began when he was 13. I'm sorry? Oh yeah, the adoption was finalized when he was an infant and they did not have ongoing contact. The first, well, the, the, all the families met each other and then the first contact they had uh, again was when he was 13. I'm sorry? Oh, do they pay for it? Um, well, no, they don't pay for it. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is extremely resource intense. Yes, and that is something we're beginning to struggle with as a business. Um, how do you charge for the, how do, you, how do we come, I mean, I have one staff person devoted to post-adopt work now, and there is no, you know, there's no um, income for that. So, um, but we charge a fairly hefty amount in the beginning of the adoption. We didn't 13 years ago, but we do now. Um, and certainly families expect, now if families go into one-on-one -on -one therapy with any of our adoption therapists, that's something that they either pay for directly or use their insurance for. Yes. Right. Right. And there's another agency in Washington um, that's uh, older than us called the Barker Foundation. You all may be familiar with the Barker Foundation. And they told us a few years ago that most of the work they do is post-adopt because they've got much older adoptees at this point. So we knew we were going to see it. We thought we'd be able to do it in a very thoughtful way. And the Facebook thing just kind of blew it open. So that's the first case, and it's, um, it's ongoing. In the second case, the, uh, he was friended by his birth mother, who was 14 when she gave birth to him. All the families had met, so she had his name. When she got Facebook, she friended him. And his family called me, and they were, for lack of a better word, hysterical. Uh, his mother was hysterical. And my attempt to calm her down only made her angrier. Uh, and what I was trying to do is calm her down so that she didn't push her son away. Um, and they eventually became calm. And then I met with the birth mother and the birth grandmother and told them, here's our protocol. We want to get to together with you. We also want you to meet with your original social worker who's still involved with the agency. And we'll be meeting with the family and we want um, uh, your son to meet with his therapist and we need to come up with some very thoughtful ways of doing this but certainly we will move toward meeting if that's advised and in my meeting with her she and her I asked them what they hoped to get out of the relationship what they envisioned out of the relationship and they said well we just want them to become a part of our family and we we're envisioning Thanksgiving dinner together and you know, that doesn't seem like, you know, in this context, that doesn't seem like such an odd thing to want. And certainly I know plenty of uh, divorce situations where eventually people 
all the fights out of them, and they all get together for the good of the adult kids and grandkids. Um, and this, it, it, was a hard, it was hard for me to imagine that the adoptive parents were going to be really thrilled with this idea, um, considering their reaction when she friended him. And their reaction was partly because they thought they had played by a very uh, well-defined set of rules and that she had upended it and that they thought that they had more time to deal with it and all those things. Um, so then the social, work got, social worker got together with the um, birth mom and she called me and she said, I don't think she's ready for a meeting. Um, she has essentially said that she doesn't want to have anything to do with the adoptive parents. She only wants to be in relationship with her son. When he turns 18, she intends on getting him back. She's planned a trip to Disneyland for his 18th birthday, and that's how she's going to manage this relationship. So, um, so we told the adoptive parents uh, and the adoptee that we didn't think that this was the right time for them to get together. And uh, so they asked their son not to text her because they had begun a texting relationship. They asked their son to stop texting, and we asked her to stop texting him. And uh, the last I talked to them, they felt that they believed their son had, was not texting her and had not met her. Um, and I think one of the strategies that they used is, you know, keep your son close. He was very close to his adoptive father. Um, they have a lot of um, outdoor activities in common. And I said, you know, keep, keep close to your son. It's 16-year-olds are difficult in, you know, in any measure. Um, so that one's kind of on hold because um, the birth mother, again, did not stay aligned with the parent. She did not want to do what the stupid agency wanted her to do. She wanted to do it on her time, in her way. And so we suggested that we just put a hold on this right now. In the third case, and this is an 18-year-old, and I think what we really learned from this 18-year-old is that if we can delay these, this contact to when kids are more older and more mature, that it is going to have better outcomes. Uh, and I'm not talking about infant adoption from the beginning where there's ongoing contact, because we'll talk about that in a while. The agency does that, and I think that's the best way to manage these, is to have ongoing contact from the beginning. But these cases were not ongoing contact from the beginning. So he, when he met his birth family, he, um, they lived in another state, and so he asked his parents if he could go visit them, and they said yes, and he went off for a visit, and he was there for four days, and he met his siblings, and that was so exciting for him. And his, um, he came back, and he was head over heels in love with his birth family, and could not stop talking about them, and the adoptive mother called and said, I'm really getting sick of how um, in love he is with them, and I said, and all you need to do is just validate that he had a wonderful experience with them and it, that you are so happy that he's develop, developing a relationship with his birth family because he's wanted that. Um, and so he's about 21 now and has had ongoing uh, visits with them. And what's gotten pr problematic and why Facebook enters this into it is that there's been a lot of very difficult things that have come out on Facebook and his birth mother um, has a lot of mental health issues and she's very immature and she puts, you know, she'll do, um, she'll say disrespectful things to him, um, like the contact with you reminded me of the terrible abuse I, I suffered at the hands of my father. And so all of this is, a lot of the relationship is being transacted on Facebook. And um, I think what's been so key for this young man is that he is a mature kid. He's in uh, school, uh, third year of college, has goals and dreams and career aspirations, is extremely close to his adoptive family, and uh, has, has a really good adoption therapist. So when he um, comes home from school, he always touches base with the adoption therapist and talks with her about how to manage this difficult relationship with his birth mother. And he very much wants to stay in touch with this family because he's got three half siblings that he is really excited about being in a lifelong relationship with. So, and the fourth case <clears throat> is um, 
So the family lives in another state, the adoptive family, and they promised their daughter they could meet her birth mother when she turned 18, and so they called us and told us that this was going to happen, and um, with or without us, and because they found her on Facebook, and they were going to just do the connection on Facebook. So our worker got to, said, we'll, we'll be happy to facilitate this. She got together with the birth mother, and the birth mother seemed like she was functioning really well, and she was engaged, and she had a job, and she had career aspirations, and she seemed really grounded. And the, uh, she met the adoptive mother and the 18-year-old, and, and then wanted the 18-year-old to come spend the night with her the next night. And at first they agreed to that, and then the 18-year-old said she didn't really feel comfortable with it, and so it was up to our worker to communicate that as the intermediary. And then the birth mother got very angry and believed that the adoptive mother was trying to prevent her from being in relationship with her. And when they went back to their other state after spring break, um, the birth mother continued to text her to the point where um, they called our worker and asked her to contact the birth mother and ask her not to text so much. And of course, she, still, she blamed that on the adoptive mother as well. And the last text exchange was, um, I was robbed of you when I, she was young, she was 15. Um, I was robbed of you. I will not let you go again. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to hire a lawyer. I'm going to come get you. And you can well imagine that this would be a very threatening thing for a young person to hear. And so our goal with this birth mother is to try to, it, try to validate how much pain she's in now and how frustrating the situation is and um, try, to, it, try to make sure that she understands what the young adoptee might be going through. Um, they do live in another state, uh, but it's really, it's really intriguing how she went from being so seemingly functional to someone who felt desperate all over again. Um, and she also revealed that she'd been raped by her father. And she told this information to the young adoptee. So that was the first time the adoptive family and the adoptee were hearing this information. We can't verify that information. It's not in the notes. We're trying to verify it because it's obviously a very problematic uh, piece of information for a young person to, um, to integrate. So, um, so our goal now is to try to stay in touch with everybody and make sure that um, this relationship is slowed down and, th and that the birth mother um, gets some support and help and counseling. Um, I was really intrigued by um, what one of our panelists said earlier and of course, this is exactly what we're saying is, because we've seen this for every one of the birth parents, um, no matter how mature and grounded they are in their lives, this meeting their child is gonna take them back to who they were then. And that's, we've, that's what we've seen in these cases. And I think that's why the birth moms, to some extent, are even attempting to align with the child, because that's the relationship they want. Any questions about these cases? Yes? Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a good point, and that is something that we talk about um, in terms of advising parents how to proceed with this. Any other questions about these four cases? <clears throat> so our first protocol, if we can, um, if we can, is to slow it down. Um, we want the adults to meet first. We want the adults to begin to be in relationship. We want the adults to understand what their basic boundaries are. Um, we want, um, if, if, when contact begins, we recommend that it often happens with a series um, of emails or letter exchanges. And we have a number of uh, adoptions that have opened up, not through Facebook, but through contact with the agency, where they've um, asked for our support and help, and they've started really slowly with like, well, here's who I am, and here's what I like to do. And so they're getting to know each other through email and through letters and through some picture exchanges. And so they're building that context that they didn't have over the last 15 years, but they're beginning, 16 years, they're beginning to build it now. We've also come up with, um, we have a lot of literature that we give people, and we're going to devise some mechanisms to make sure that they they fill out questionnaires and that they can talk with us about questionnaires so that they can be conversant with some of the things they may feel that they're really surprised at feeling. Um, and what are their expectations? I, um, everybody's bringing some pretty dramatic expectations to this meeting and we want them to identify them in the beginning so that uh, they don't do what this last birth mother did where she just completely um, you know, became so distressed and so frantic at the thought that she was going to lose her daughter again that she was threatening her actually to not lose her again. And uh, like our colleague said here, reminding everybody that even though this is your child's birth parent and an extremely important person in your life and in your child's parents, you really don't know each other at all. You're virtual strangers you have, don't have shared history. What, one of the things I noticed about my daughter, who's had pretty ongoing contact with her birth parents all her life, is when she would get together with her birth mother when she was a younger child, she would turn to me and say, hey mom, remember when we did this, and remember when I did that, and remember the year that this happened, and remember the time the neighbor's dog did. She was sort of describing for her birth mother, I think, her history with us because she had no shared history with her. So I think that's something that people need to be reminded of because maybe they've had a fantasy history about this. Um, a, a lot of the next slides are about teenagers and I'm assuming that you all know about teenagers and um, how sort of normatively psychotic they are anyway. Uh, and so, uh, but we do know that they are definitely um, you know, definitely run by their impulses. So, uh, and, and that's why I, I call Facebook an attractive nuisance. It's pro there's probably another description of Facebook, but it's sort of like really, it's developed in many ways for the teenage brain, I think, um, because it's immediate. You know, you can do these immediate things that you had to wait for. You know, we still live in an era where people hired private detectives to find to find their biological relatives, and I imagine some of that still goes on. Y yes. Did they unfriend them? Um, I think the only formal unfriending was when um, the, uh, the, in the first case, the young person who friended his birth mother when he was in residential treatment and he um, went into Al-Anon it was an essential unfriending, but I don't think he ever unfriended her. So, um, but he did become very angry at her having offered him drugs um, and reportedly from his adoptive mother did confront her about it. Not to my knowledge. I mean, I think from the Facebook contact began 
uh, the texting, you know, and the, and the texting is a really attractive way to communicate with somebody um, in your home if you're a teenager because um, you can do that so privately um, without your parents knowing what's going on. <clears throat> and of course, um, for teenagers, uh, you know, these types of, uh, this type of contact can be so complicated because they are figuring out who they are and who they want to be like. Um, my daughter had a very difficult year, her 17th year, and she um, got into some trouble that was very reminiscent of her birth mother. And she called her birth mother and was looking for her approval, you know, of what had happened. And um, her birth mother uh, at the time said, you know, I was a much more mature, I was, you know, married at the time, you know, she talked about the differences in their situation. Um, and I was really grateful to her that she responded to her in a parental way and not in a way, you know, that would have validated this really problematic thing that she was embarking on. I'm going to um, just go through some of these fairly quickly because, again, um, I'm assuming that we all know about teenagers and their identity formation, but please stop me if you have a question about any of them because I want to get to um, some more meat on, on how to manage these issues. I think one of the things I noticed, too, in the friending situation uh, in the first birth mother when the adoptee friended her, she didn't friend him back right away. She called the agency and said, this is happening and I want his parents to know about it. And immediately, you know, she said, this is, you know, I just feel so terrible because I don't want to not friend him. I don't want to reject him. I don't want him to feel abandoned or rejected. He probably already feels some of that um, from my having placed him for adoption. So you can see the conflicts starting, um, and, you know, it's just a really complicated reaction. Yes? We've not had that experience yet, except I will say in the first case study, uh, the birth parents were married and now they're divorced and they have a terribly contentious relationship. And the birth mother began posting on Facebook that she was in contact with their birth son um, so they met on Facebook and they began posting all these things on Facebook and the birth father called and said, I know that she's got a relationship with our son and why does she get to have a relationship and I don't have a relationship and I want to reach out and friend him and I want the same thing she has. And at this point, the boy was really beginning to devolve quite a bit and uh, refusing to go to school and having all kinds of psychological issues. And his therapist said, I think we need to keep his world really small right now and not introduce any more birth relatives at this time. And I called the birth father and asked him to respect that, and he did. Um, so, and every year he calls and asks again. And I'm profoundly grateful to him that he's really respecting it. And, and he doesn't know the nature of the child's difficulties, and I know that's difficult for him because, as he says, he's my child. I want to know what his difficulties are. And I said, it's, I can't reveal this to you because of confidentiality, but you know the adoptive family. You met the adoptive family. I know you trust them, and they're doing the best they can to make sure that he gets all the support and help that he needs, and please don't attempt contact right now. So, so that's the only birth father that you know, we've, we've heard from at this point. But I suspect there will be more. <laughs> right. So when I, I, I was not adopted, and I, but when I was growing up, I remember I was pretty sure that I was adopted because I was sure I must have had better parents somewhere. And I, I think that many, many, I don't think that's an unusual thing for people, when they, especially when they're teenagers, to believe that there had to have been better parents. And of course, for adopted persons, they do have other parents. And so 
um, they can fantasize that they're better and hipper and cooler. Uh, and that is part of the attraction for them to connect, of course. If they haven't had ongoing contact, um, that's one of the attractions. And I think the whole issue of what kind of relationship can we have, that is really the crux of it. Um, you have this biological connection. You don't know each other. How long will it take to have a relationship? Um, we, our agency saw a study recently that said typically it takes up to seven years for a birth parent and an adopted person to develop a normalized relationship if they have not had ongoing contact. And we don't live in an era where seven years makes any sense to people. They want it in seven minutes. So um, one of the most important goals when we are working with these out of the blue and even the ones that are calling and asking for some thoughtful process is to help people slow down and try to figure out um, what are the steps to having any relationship if you meet somebody. What you find things in common, you do things in common, you share increasingly intimate information, you have more and more shared experiences, you meet other, other friends and family members, you have to, I mean, there's so many different building blocks that you, can, you need to put into any relationship. And I think that's been the hardest thing for these impulsive Facebook uh, contact as well as the ones that are meeting after 16, 17, 18 years. They have this fantasy of instant connection, instant relationship. And that's very hard for any of us to achieve, and it can be very discouraging and disappointing. Um, and so certainly we've seen that with adoptees. I think it's been incredibly frustrating and disappointing for a lot of the adoptees, and very disappointing and frustrating for the birth moms, as we're seeing in our clinical work with them. The most powerful connection we're finding for adoptees is the sibling connection. Um, what I notice in, with my daughter, and she's had this open adoption since infancy, um, is that as we, and we would go, go back and forth uh, over the years and, and visit, and it was, we would stay at their house, they would stay at, stay at our house, it was very um, casual, and we did develop a relationship with them. And she, um, uh, she found them to be, at some point when she was a teenager, they were just an, two other boring adults who talked too much. And, uh, and it was really challenging when she invited her birth father without my knowing that she had invited him to stay with us for four days, which is a long time for anybody to stay in your home. Um, and um, she was kind of done with him after 30 minutes. Um, and that's when I, you know, I'm like, listen, young lady, you invited him here. <laughs> You better be on your best behavior and connect with him and take him places and do stuff with him because you've got three and a half more days. Um, so um, that's, <laughs> and she did. She, you know, she, she rose to the occasion. Um, so the sibling connection we're seeing in all of these ad adoptions, these kids are, yes, they want to know their birth parents. They want to know who they look like. They want to know the story. They want to know the history. Um, they want to know what, you know, what kind of relationship can we have, but the real dramatic, dynamic, intense energy is coming from the siblings because they're the ones that are going to be there for the long haul, um, and they're the ones they're the most fascinated with, and they're really the ones they have the most in common with, um, as we do have uh, more commonality with people closer in age. So there's so many issues that get enacted. Um, whether it happens from Facebook or um, uh, you know, regular contact, there's a lot of fear on the part of adoptive parents that the birth parents are going to be a negative influence. And we have a few examples of that where um, a, a birth mothers would uh, say undermining things about how the adoptive parents parented. Um, and there's also the negative possibilities of from the adoptive parents where they may, may react so negatively, um, so strongly, so angrily that they're going to push their child away and they're going to um, push the birth parent away. So managing all of these volatile emotions is something that, you know, 
I, I said earlier we had one person who, whose job it was to deal with post contact, and we do have one staff person, but we've begun managing this as a team where each person is assigned a different, a different person in, in this relationship to try to support and counsel and manage. <clears throat> the, um, that original story challenge, I think, is something that we've seen with adoptive parents because um, for, in our one case where the 16-year-old was friended, um, you know, they had been saying wonderful things about his birth mother for 16 years, which was completely appropriate. They'd met her once and they really liked her and they presented her as a, as a you know, a really loving person who was in a difficult spot. So they did that adoption story and, and now he's got, you know, now in reality his birth mother is, I'm sure she's all those things as well, but she's also behaving in a way, you know, that's different from how they presented her. And that creates some conflicting issues for the adoptee as well. Of course, children want to go behind our backs. That makes it even more fun to do the Facebook thing. Yeah, Erin. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they are, they are really disillusioned because um, they have their own fantasies, and those, of course, are both created and fed by those media images. But, you know, I forget when the whole talk show phenomenon started. I mean, it's probably at least 20 years old, right, or longer. Do you remember those reunions? I mean, I would watch them, and I would be weeping, and I would know that they were a crock. I mean, they were so emotional, not, a, you know, not a crock in the, in the way. Of course, these people are emotional, but... It's just a, it's a more, much more complicated issue than is presented. Um, so certainly, um, when I first took my daughter to see her birth mother after she was born, she was two. And I remember having the fear that, oh my gosh, she's going to run to her birth mother like her long lost mother. And I'm chopped liver and that's the end of that. And it seemed really hard and painful and of course that didn't happen because she'd been with me since infancy and I was the only mother that she knew. Um, and in fact what I tell adoptive parents is if you want to feel entitled about your adoption there's no better way than having an open adoption because your child is attached to you and they will grow up knowing that their birth parent is an extremely important person in their lives and they will find a special place in their psyches for her and they will develop their own relationship. But you will see the power of this ancient institution called adoption when you have an open adoption. So. So I think it's so complicated for um, every party in this, and we're finding the complexities for the birth parent really poignant um, because it's taking them back to who they were during this painful relinquishment. And no matter how much support or counseling or processing of this enormous act in their lives at, at this time, at that time in their lives, this meeting of their child is going to reawaken things that they haven't been thinking about possibly in um, years and years. And inspiring behavior in them that's not their normal behavior, like our mom who's threatening legal action to get her child back because she's so desperate now that she's met her again and now she knows what she's lost. She knew she lost something really significant, and now she's got an 18-year-old daughter that she's met, who she knows she's, she feels is going to be lost to her again, and she's ex in extreme pain about it. <clears throat> so, um, 
I th our colleague mentioned earlier that you know you see adoptive parents doing things that they wouldn't normally do with any strangers, and I think adoptive parents often feel like they want to be the best adoptive parent ever, um, and do the right thing, and may make some missteps and misjudgments in this whole issue. And I think the mom who told her daughter that she was going to bring her to Washington to meet her birth mother when she was 18, and she'd been promising that forever. I think, you know, that was something that probably in retrospect she wished she hadn't promised. So it's pretty important um, to think these things through. Uh, so I think adoptive parents often do um, forget this is someone you don't know. She's a stranger, and hopefully she's a decent person stranger, and there can be a good relationship, but you do have a lot of ground to go through before that can happen. And this is really the crux of our education with families and our preparation for everybody now, is that this is way more complicated than you can even imagine, and here are some of the issues, and here are some of the things that can happen, and we want to help support you every step of the way. It's not going to be that grassy, beautiful park with flowers with an orchestra playing. Um, it's, you know, real life is messy, families are particularly messy, and uh, there's a lot of relationship, relationship to negotiate now. So I think for adoptive parents, there's all kinds of things that can be um, enacted. Um, they can become really worried. Our, um, the adoptive mother of the 18-year-old who's in his third year of college now was, and he met his birth parents before he went off to college, she was really scared that none of them had gone to college and maybe they would be bad-mouthing college and maybe he would decide he didn't want to go to college. So those, those very practical concerns get enacted. Um, of course, the mother who found out that her son was offered drugs by his birth mother had a whole new um, thing to be concerned about. So there can, they are worried about the negative influence of people that they don't know whose lives were pretty compromised at the point they made that adoption plan. Um, and are they still compromised? And then I think every adoptive parent can always wonder, you know, will my child love their birth parent more than me? Um, I do know a family um, whose 16-year-old uh, uh, connected with her birth mother and went to live with her birth mother. So it's not that it never happens. I mean, we do reassure families that this is unlikely to happen, but, but I do know a case where it did happen, and the adoptive parents and the birth parents then really began co-parenting this child. And she would come to visit the adoptive parents, and they paid for her schooling, and they're important people to her, but she lives with and is most attached to her birth mother right now. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, and I know that's what adoptive parents worry about, um, and it's unlikely, but I do know a case, so I can't say it would never happen. <laughs> so I think the birth parents that we've um, been working with, um, there's a lot, by the way, we have a lot of cases that didn't begin on Facebook, which are moving along slowly and thoughtfully and very healthily. Um, and it awakens so many things for them. There's so much stigma around being a birth mother still. And there's so little support from being a birth mo for, for being a birth mother still. And so being thrust back into that role, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges that we need to help people sort out is what role do I play? I'm a child's birth mother. She, I'm not her parent. What, who am I? What role do I play? Am I a friendly relative? Am I a friendly older sister? Am I the good aunt? You know, there are, there's no blueprint. So I think for those who are trying, like the birth mom said, I wanted you to think I'm cool. That's why I offered you drugs. She's trying to find a way to connect. What is my role? Is my role just to be a slightly older sister who offers my brother drugs? Um, or is my role to be a really cool mom who takes my son to Disneyland? Um, you know, like a, a wealthy divorced dad, you know, that term Disneyland dad. Um, what role are, am I going to play? Because there's no blueprint in American society for who you are as a birth mother. 
uh, in your child's life, um, especially when you're having this, um, the first meeting is happening after all these years. And for the, um, for the teen, of course, uh, some of the really poignant issues we've seen um, are the, uh, our oldest adoptee in the case study. He knows his birth mother has really significant mental health issues, and he knows his birth father has really significant mental health issues. And he's very compassionate toward them, um, and he really worries about them. And his birth mother um, is uh, currently divorcing um, from her current husband, and he's really worried about that. So in some ways, he's feeling really protective of her, which is very interesting because in all of his relationships with girlfriends, he's the protector. So um, it's the, everybody's got to figure out what role to play, you know, and how it's going to work. It obviously works the best when there's a lot of mutual respect and people can um, acknowledge and respect each other's boundaries. Any parent is going to be worried about a new adult in their child's life that they don't know. And that's how we try to normalize it for parents. Of course you're worried about the influence of your child's birth parent when you don't know them very well. And you're, we're always concerned about influences on our teenagers because they're very influenced. So adoptive families are in high state of anxiety in, these, in, the, in this type of contact, especially when it's been so impulsive. Of course, it's ideal if nobody Facebooks each other out of the blue and that there's a lot of controls on Facebook. Um, and there are a lot of controls that people um, can enact. I'm curious as to how it works in your own homes. Um, we would not let our daughter have a Facebook account unless we had access to it. Yet, I hear people say all the time, my son 16 years old, won't, he's defriended me and he won't let me see his Facebook. So I'm just curious about what you all think about that. Right. Right. Uh, yes, they can have access outside the home. And so I think what some parents have thought is, well, I'd rather um, have it go on in my home. Um, any other ideas? Yes. So the question is, the question is, um, what Facebook controls do you think are appropriate for parents to, to enact? Yeah. Yeah. So my, my comment is the limitation is based assuming that you can limit their access to initiate Facebook accounts. So in a home, yes, I can say you're not going to have a Facebook account unless I'm a friend, but I, that's only helpful if I can then eliminate you don't have access to create a Facebook account at school or at the library or at a friend's house or when you go visit my brother. Um, and so that becomes the issue that children can access and create a Facebook account without our knowledge, assuming they can lie about their age being 13. And so it's, you know, you can create that rule within your house, but in terms of the access to create it, that to me reflects larger on the relationship and not always, but. Right, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've had a little experience with this. Um, I have an adopted teenager and um, first of all, I, I asked her to not have a Facebook page. She did have one without my permission and I tried to get access. She wouldn't friend me. <laughs> um, I did eventually get access and well, there's a few things to be aware of. Um, even if your child does give you access, they may have other Facebook pages. Right. The other thing to be aware of is that on Facebook, um, there is an instant messaging feature. So even if right. you have access to the Facebook, you may not know what conversation is sure. going on. Um, it's been it's been a kind of a difficult road. We've we've tried to kind of negotiate about this, mm -hmm. but it is difficult. And we also I know of other adoptive families 
that have had bad experiences of this where birth parents have approached the adopt the child without the adoptive parents mm -hmm. knowledge and have um, lured them away and right. in some cases uh, brought them to live with them and opened up social security in their name so they live off the social security interesting there's, there's been a lot of sure difficult experiences but yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know all of this but yeah I'm, I'm afraid I do <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um, the next couple of slides, and this should be available to you all if it's helpful, is um, how to have Facebook discussions, how to have these privacy settings, um, and to talk to your child really honestly about being careful about putting information out there, um, and explore their curiosity about their birth family. Um, hopefully, the adoptive families that we're working with are all talking to their kids about adoption all the time, you know, when it's appropriate. And have, and have begun in infancy. Um, there's a lot of good counseling services for adoptees. Um, those who are considering this in a thoughtful, slower way, you know, can access counseling to see whether or not it's the right time for them. Um, this is one of the, the things that we're really working on at our agency, is really how to explore the fantasies and expectations with each party. And we've come up with um, some questionnaires that we want each party to answer first and that, that we can then sit down and talk with them um, about, you know, what outcome would they like? What would be the best possible thing that could happen? What would be the worst possible thing to happen? The agency, um, we are the intermediary and we've also done some, you know, we're working in really at mediated, mediating these conflicts all the time. So sitting the parties down and asking them what they want and really kind of negotiating like we're doing with the birth mom who's having such a hard time, we're asking her, instead of texting your daughter every day, um, text once a week and call us once a week so that we can walk you through how you're feeling and what's going on for you because the daughter clearly needs some distance right now. And as she pulls away, the birth mother gets more frantic. And as the birth mother gets more frantic, she's feel, it feels more threatening to the child. So we're teaching her how this is coming across. Um, and we are really working hard to mediate some kind of slower growth relationship here. Did you have a question? all of our adoptions are open. And so we're, and we have binding post-adoption agreements in our state. And the expectation is that there's going to be at least one visit a year. Um, and so what we're seeing on those adoptions, and at this point there, I think the oldest one is about six or seven years old now. Um, and, or maybe older, maybe, maybe 10 um, or 11. Um, those families have been emailing and setting up websites and um, using technology to stay in touch this whole time. And for the child, they're growing up with a very um, regular, regular contact, learning slowly as they grow older who, who this person is that they see once or twice a year and what her you know, role is in their lives. So. Uh, uh, Hi. Uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Yep. Yes. Yeah, I do. We say, we say stop. So, um, and that is really true. But people get in trouble because they've gone outside uh, this agreement uh, significantly. And once we, you know, once you go outside something, then that you set up that expectation. So, um, are you raising your hand because you have a question or because? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, finish. <laughs> yeah. Um, once, so we tell people, let's bring it back to the agreement. All right, it's one visit a year, it's one phone call, you know, whatever it is, it's out here and it's gotten problematic and the adoptive parents are threatening not to do it anymore. And our most, and the most important goal for us is to get this agreement back on track so that these parties can feel safe and that this child can grow up knowing both his parents. So um, those agreements um, really provide a, a very safe structure. And I'm not suggesting that every relationship should stick to a strict agreement but that for those that are going to go a little crazy out there, it's really good to do it long enough to develop a solid relationship. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I have two questions. One you may have addressed at the uh, beginning, and I apologize for coming in late. Um, do you do any um, post-placement support for international adoptions? In terms of open adoption? Yes. Um, you know, I can't speak to that because I'm the domestic director. Um, I know that there, um, there are all kinds of ways that international adoptees can get information and connect with their biological relatives, and that's not something that I'm conversant with. So. Okay. Then, and the other question, um, has to do with the domestic um, uh, adoptions and um, the degree to which, if at all, um, cultural differences, socioeconomic differences, in the case of transracial placements, mm -hmm. um, those emerge as part of the dynamics of these difficulties that families and birth, uh, adoptive and birth families are dealing with. Yes, that's exactly right. So um, what people are, what folks are facing in this relationship is that you may not have a lot in common with the birth and adoptive families may have very little in common, uh, education-wise, socio-economically, um, interests, values, all kinds of things. And so navigating that relationship and bridging those gaps, um, finding commonality um, is definitely a challenge for people. And it's part of the reason adoptive parents worry about influences and why birth families get frustrated with adoptive families, too. So. Um, these are, I like the uh, term kinship of strangers, um, because you really are strangers and um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gap to bridge. Hi, uh, to bring it back to Facebook real quick. Um, I know communication on Facebook is one thing, but just personal experience, when uh, Marla told me don't post any pictures on Facebook, that was it for me. Like I, I, I use it a lot, probably not as much as a 16 year old, but as far as like for all those open adoptions with 16 plus, do um, have you run into any issues where those birth mothers or birth parents are posting pictures from their visits and uh, maybe tagging or if they're not friends, not tagging and therefore now the picture of their child and their adoptive family's child is now on the internet right. that can be stolen? Uh, we actually ask people to sign an agreement saying they won't do that. Uh, and, and the agency has a, uh, has a uh, secure server called Child Connect, and families upload their pictures, and they both have confidential logins, and so they post pictures and videos and updates and letters, and um, it's a very dynamic place for them to have some safety and security. And uh, the, birth parents, uh, the birth parents we work with completely understand that it's not appropriate to post these um, photos, you know, on their Facebook at this point. So, um, you know, I think these things will change over time, you know, so. Susan, we have time for one last question. Okay. Well, actually, I wanted to ask, is, is there a way for us to get copies of your slides? I'm sorry? Is there a way for us to get copies of your slides? I hope so. Um, I mean, I thought that was the plan. I mean, I did um, send this to Jen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Yes, so let me show you a little bit about, um, so um, here's some tips on, on make, you know, making the birth mom an ally, um, trying to keep those parents aligned together. Um, and then we, a little bit about our laws in our state. Um, there are, right, so here's what we're doing with birth parents before contact. We're asking them to fill out this questionnaire and talk it through with us. Um, so it's questions like, you know, what do you know about your child? How do you feel about the adoption? Um, and these are very open-ended questions, and I would imagine that they're going to lead to more questions. Um, I think this is going to be, you know, probably a three-hour meeting with the birth mom to talk through these things. Um, and ask them to consider things like, you know, what if you meet your child and you don't like your child? <laughs> or you feel like your child doesn't like you, which could happen because you're a, a grown-up, you know. So, um, and then it's really important for us to know who their support system is, who knows about the adoption, who can help them process this. We're going to help them as much as possible, but there may be other trusted people in their lives. For adoptive parents, um, I mean, the mom who told us, you know, you can facilitate this or we're just going to find her, we found her on Facebook, we're going to do it ourselves. You know, um, I, I mean, I want to be really humble and clear. We're learning what to do from every case for the next case. This is an ongoing practice learning for our agency and probably other agencies as well. And I hope we all can learn from each other uh, because it is um, a really complicated world. And I, what I'm telling parents now who don't want an open adoption, that, well, in the age of the internet, we're all telling, we're all saying closed adoption is a thing of the past. You can have regular get-togethers, relationship building with your child's birth family and your child from infancy, or your child can friend his birth mom when he's 14. And I, I don't mean to sound glib, because I don't feel glib about it, but that's a very, that makes, a, people seem to hear that, that they kind of get it, like, oh yeah, over normalized, regular, documented get-togethers are gonna provide so much history and context for, for children and the goal, in my view, is that children ha keep those connections between their birth families and, and their adoptive families and themselves. And more importantly, when, after they become adults, they have enough context over time. They've begun to build this relationship slowly, but they have enough context now that they can have a relationship with their birth family as an adult that doesn't begin with an impulsive Facebook contact and doesn't begin with dramatic expectations and fantasy, but has been re rooted in reality this whole time. Uh, and my own unfunded adoption, um, unfunded adoption study with my daughter and her birth family is um, what I notice about her is that she really does understand them at a very deep level, their strengths and weaknesses, like she understands her adoptive parents' strengths and weaknesses. And that's what I wanted for her, is that she would know who they are in reality, and that she would be able to embrace them with real information and not her own fantasies. And so that's what we're driving home for adoptive parents, um, and they're really seeming to understand that. Um, and in the meantime, we're having to manage these um, <clears throat> manage these uh, Facebook adoptions and um, these one first time 16 year old adoptions and they're definitely a challenge for us but I think slowing it down, giving them lots to think about, making sure that they've got support systems, making sure they understand that this may awaken something in you that you have not been thinking about or feeling for many years um, and that it's going to be potentially very painful and complicated, um, which is not a reason not to do it, but which is a reason to be really thoughtful uh, and considered about it. So um, I guess we're out of time. 
The last pages have some resources and supports. Um, and um, thank you very much for all your questions.